karma and the details of life. Our lecture today shall be devoted to subjects that are interesting in the widest sense to anthroposophists, subjects intended to throw light on certain points that may have puzzled those who have attended our group meetings for a considerable time. It is well, now and then, to recall that the point of importance in anthroposophy is not so much the learning of certain things as theory or doctrine, but that we should continually enter in greater detail into the questions and enigmas of life. Some people may perhaps say that all that it is necessary to know of anthroposophy for use in life could be easily contained in a small pamphlet of sixty pages or so. Everyone could possess a copy and would then be convinced as to the nature of man, reincarnation and karma, and the evolution of humanity on the earth, and could go through life needing nothing further. Such people might suggest that the anthroposophical movement distribute as many copies as possible of such a booklet, so that everyone could acquire a copy and convince himself. Why does the Anthroposophical Society adopt the curious methods of holding meetings week after week, assembling all those interested or likely to become interested, simply for the purpose of constantly describing anew what might comfortably be reduced to a sixty-page pamphlet? What can these anthroposophists possibly have to say to their followers week after week? There may be certain types of mind today who would like to have a small outline of anthroposophy that they could keep in their pockets and thus study what it is most important to know. We must, however, bring to mind over and over again the fact that nothing can be done in this way with anthroposophy. There can be no tabloid knowledge. Although anthroposophy does depend on knowledge, it does not consist of mere phrases, but of definite knowledge. It is not enough merely to acquire this knowledge in a general conviction according to present methods and then rest satisfied. The point is not merely that one should acquire the conviction and know that man lives many lives, that there are causal conditions that pass over from one life to another, and that there is such a thing as reincarnation or karma. The beneficial effects of anthroposophy do not lie in spreading this knowledge, but they are felt in the constant and repeated study of all the details connected with it, and in allowing this to work upon one's soul. It does, no one, it does one no good simply to believe that man lives more than once, and that there is such a law as that of reincarnation, karma, and so on. Mere belief will not carry one far. As regards the real depths of life, there is not much difference between the soul of a man who knows of reincarnation and karma and one who knows nothing of it. In an anthroposophical sense, our souls are only changed when we constantly study, not only the general generalities, but also the deeper things that spiritual science can teach us. That is why it is good that we repeatedly consider how the various details of life appear in the light of anthroposophical conception. It is by no means sufficient merely to know that there is a great law of destiny establishing a connection between the past deeds, feelings, and thoughts of a man and his present and future experiences. Anthroposophy will only become a factor in life when we can apply this general doctrine to the different experiences of life, when we become able to put our whole soul into such a position that we obtain an entirely new outlook on life. That is why we will today spend a little time studying the law of karma, the great law of destiny, with reference to the details of life. Things will be spoken of that are familiar to all, but they will be considered from the standpoint of karma. In a general sense, karma signifies that there is a connection in the spiritual world between what takes place today, what will take place in the future, and what has occurred in the past. It is not really correct to call karma the law of causality and then to compare it with the law of cause and effect in the external world. If we wish to find a comparison for this great law of destiny, we must take care that the comparison is valid and really under represents the law. Let us take the following example. Suppose we have two vessels containing water and two metal balls all at normal room temperature. We throw one ball into one of the vessels 
and the temperature of the water does not change. We now heat the other ball, drop it into the other vessel, and its water becomes warm. Why has the water in the second vessel become warm and that in the first not? Because the ball itself underwent a change before it was thrown into the vessel. Having first been heated, it brings about the warming of the water. An event occurred that was the result of another event, that is, the result of the ball having been heated. Thus the experiences and activities of a former time are connected with the experiences and phenomena of the present or future. When we grasp the law of the spiritual connections between past, present, and future in this way, we shall be able to find it confirmed in ordinary life, in the everyday life around us, even though we may be far from having as yet developed any clairvoyant faculties. We must always establish as a golden rule the fact that while a law of the spiritual world can only be proved by the spiritual researcher through clairvoyant observation, it can always be corroborated by the experiences of the external world. People will have to accustom themselves to observe external life a little more carefully than usual, however, if they wish to find confirmation of the law of karma. Figuratively speaking, they do not, as a rule, see beyond the end of their noses, but anyone who observes more profoundly will find plenty of confirmation between birth and death of the existence of the law of karma. Let us keep to the concrete as far as possible and consider the following example. A young lad, fifteen years old, was torn away by unforeseen circumstances from the life he had been accustomed to lead. Up until this time the position of his parents had made it possible for him to study. But now at the age of fifteen, in consequence perhaps of his father having lost his fortune, he had to go into business. He was thus switched from one vocation to another. The point here, of course, is not that the one vocation was in any way better than the other, but that his life was altered by the change. Now people who contemplate life in the ordinary materialistic sense would probably not expect anything noteworthy to be brought about by the influence of such an event on a man's life, and thus they would find nothing in it. A more careful observer, however, would discover that a young man who entered the business world in this way would at first feel pleasure in the change and would like his new work. His interest in it would grow with his own growth, as one might say. After a while, however, something strange would become evident. The soul experiences, the sympathies and antipathies he felt in his work, might, when he reached the age of eighteen or nineteen, assume a different form. He might cease to take pleasure in it, and his attitude toward business alter. Those who have never heard of anthroposophy would be at a loss to account for what took place in the young man's soul. What then actually occurred? When the young man was fifteen and was put into the new job, he took a great interest in it. At first his interest drove out the feelings and sentiments that had formed in him when he was studying. The, those feelings were pushed into the background. The time came, however, when these feelings broke through again with all the more strength. It is as though one compresses an elastic object to a certain point, after which it springs back with all the more rapidity. Similarly, the result, in the case of this young chap, may have been that the interests that were thrust aside for a time finally burst forth with greater zeal. When he reached eighteen or nineteen, the feelings and sentiments that penetrated his soul three years before he changed his vocation, that is, those he felt at eleven or twelve, burst forth anew. Life can only be explained in such a case by saying that when this lad was fifteen, a turning point occurred in his life, after which things happened whose external effects were felt the same number of years after the turning point as the cause of them originated before that time. Just think how we would be able to help a person regarding his soul moods and difficulties of life if we were able to ascertain when such a turning point occurred. It may have been connected with something quite private and intimate, but if we can place it, we can then reckon back and it will be found that the spiritual effects reveal themselves just as long after the turning point as the cause of them was before that time. This gives us an insight into karma. 
Such knowledge is a help in life, and we may say that causes and effects of this nature are connected with definite periods of time and are determined by definite periods in life. If we count backwards and forwards from the turning point, we can find the connection between cause and effect. Now such a case might, of course, be concealed by the intervention of other events. Someone might say that this example is of no use because he knows a similar young man to whom it does not apply. Well, I know a case of two men who were playing billiards. When a passing waiter bumped into the one who was about to play, his ball was driven in quite a different direction from what he intended. The law of cause and effect was not at fault, but other circumstances intervened. We must realize that we shall never learn to know this law if we do not disregard the things that upset it. In the case of the young man, for example, after the age of fifteen, other circumstances might have arisen that would interfere with the law. We do not become acquainted with laws simply by observing life, but by acquiring the right method of summing up life's phenomena. In life things are being constantly disturbed, and the laws cannot so easily be seen. We can only regulate our lives by knowing how these laws are to be found. When we know the details, we can say, in the case of the young man whose life was upset, that it is the task of those responsible for his education to take heed. In this way karma becomes a law of life. If we have knowledge of this law, we can make use of our knowledge when such cases occur. If we find that we cannot give the young man what he previously had, we can at any rate become his advisor. We can only give the right advice, however, if we know of the existence of such connections as those I have spoken of, if we know what is the matter with him and intervene with help just where and when his particular lack is making itself felt. If we are ignorant of this law, we obviously cannot help with advice. When we see the law of karma as a law of life, however, it can become an influence in life that can teach us to become counselors. Of course, this one case does not exhaust all the possible combinations. Let me mention another way in which the law of karma is experienced between birth and death. There is a remarkable connection between the experiences a man has in the first half of life and the second, but this is generally not noticed. One often makes the acquaintance of a man in his youth and loses sight of him before he reaches maturity, or else one only meets a man when he is old and one knows nothing of his youth. Or even if one did not know him in youth, one may have long since forgotten what has happened to him. Were we to study and compare the beginnings and ends of people's lives, we should find the finest confirmation of the law of karma, even in the life between birth and death. In this connection, perhaps you may remember what I have said in public lectures about the noble anger that appears in youth. I have explained that a young person is not fully able to judge an injustice that may take place around him. He is not yet mature enough. Yet the wise rulership of the world has so ordained things that our feelings will help us to judge truly before our reason is mature enough to do so. A noble nature will, even in childhood, be moved to a righteous anger by anything like injustice, although it may be only in his feelings that his soul can sense the injustice. He may not yet be ripe to judge of it through his intellect. When this noble sense of indignation is to be found in the character of a child, we ought to take particular note of it, because the judgment of feeling aroused by the injustice remains in the soul. <clears throat> this noble anger in early youth permeates the soul, and as life goes on becomes transformed. In the second half it reappears in a different form, as the quality of loving-kindness and goodness. We shall not often find loving, bounteous goodness in the latter part of a man's life, other things being equal, and if nothing has occurred to distort the sequence, without finding that it was expressed in his early years by a noble anger aroused at the stupidity of the ugly things of life. In ordinary life we find a karmic connection that we may visualize by saying that the hand that never clenched its fist in noble anger in the first half of life will not easily be stretched forth in blessing in the latter half. 
Such things will, of course, only be observed by one who can see a little further than the end of his nose, which is just what most people do not do. I might give a simple example to show how little inclined people are to notice such things in life. I have often mentioned how helpful it is to one who wishes to become intimately acquainted with life in order to study more deeply the occult conditions of the soul, to have been a teacher at some time. One learns more of the soul in that way than can be garnered from the ordinary textbooks on psychology, which are quite worthless as a rule. A knowledge of the soul is acquired when we do not merely observe and study, but have to take the responsibility of guiding and directing the lives of others. One learns thus to observe more exactly. During the long years of my tutorship, I not only observed the children in my charge, but I had many opportunities to study other children of all ages, even from birth, when other families came to visit them. That was some twenty-five to thirty years ago. You may have noticed how every five years or so the doctors have a different opinion as to what is good for people. Well, at that time they were strongly of the opinion that it was quite strengthening for delicate children, three, four, or five years old, to drink a glass of red wine every day. I knew certain children who had their glass of wine and others who did not, and so was able to make my own observations. Of course, at that time, the doctor's opinion was considered infallible, and it would have been of no use to attempt to go against it. I was thus able to wait for the results to show themselves. The children, who were then from two to five years old, and who were given the glass of wine to strengthen them, are now young men and women of twenty-five to twenty-eight, the age at which I particularly noticed that the results of the treatment showed themselves. All the children who were given wine have become fidgety fills. Their astral bodies are fidgety because they do not have much control of them. They do not know how to control the involuntary movements of their soul lives. On the other hand, those children who, unfortunately, as was then said, could not have their glass of red wine have become stable natures, less wobbly in their astral bodies, or as materialists would say, in their nervous systems. This is an example of the connections that exist in life, a rather trivial one, not particularly illustrative of karma, but it serves to show that we should not limit ourselves to looking only as far as the end of our noses. Longer periods of time should be surveyed, because it is not sufficient merely to affirm that a remedy will have a particular effect. The actual results can only be observed by the true observer many years later. Nothing but the great connections and all that leads us to find them can in reality give us the true explanations of the relation between cause and effect in the life of man. Thus we must try to connect the qualities of the soul with those phenomena of life that apparently lie far apart. We shall then be able to trace the law of karma, even between birth and death, frequently finding as a result that the events of later life are connected with the experiences of the earlier. You may remember what I said of the mission of devotion, of the importance of looking up in feeling to some being or some phenomenon that we do not yet understand, but that we revere for the very reason that we have not yet grown up to the level of being able to understand it. I always like to remind you of how fortunate it is when a man can say that as a child, He heard of a member of his family who was greatly respected and honored. He had not yet seen him, but had a profound reverence for him. Then one day the opportunity arrived and he was taken to see him. A feeling of profound and holy awe came over him as he laid his hand on the handle of the door of the room where this wonderful person was to be seen. In later life a man will have good reason to be grateful for that feeling of reverent devotion. We owe much to the fact that we were able to feel reverence in our early lives. That feeling is of great and special value in any life. I have known men who, when such a feeling of reverent devotion to the spiritual and divine is alluded to, exclaim, I am an atheist, I cannot revere anything spiritual. Look at the starry heavens, we can reply. Could you create those? Look at that wisdom-filled creation and reflect that there it is surely possible to have a feeling of real, true reverence. There are many things in the world that our understanding has not yet grown up to, but to which we can look up in reverence. Especially is this the case in youth, when there is so much we can look up to and venerate without being able to understand it. 
A feeling of devotion in early youth is transformed into a special quality in the second half of life. We have all heard of persons who just by being themselves are a blessing, as it were, to those around them. There is no need for them to say anything in particular. Their presence is enough. It is as though something invisible flows forth from them to the souls around them by the very nature of their beings. Through their very nature they radiate a healing and beneficent influence on their environment. To what do these people owe their power of blessing? They owe it to the circumstance that in their youth they lived lives in which reverence played a part. Reverence in the early part of their lives was transformed in later years into a force that works invisibly, pouring forth blessing and help. Here again is a karmic connection that, if we look for it, is clearly and distinctly to be observed. It was really a true feeling for karma that led Goethe to choose as the motto for one of his works the beautiful words, What we desire in youth is fulfilled in old age. If we only observe the connections to be found in short periods of time, it may certainly seem as though we could speak of of unfulfilled wishes, but taking longer spans of time, this cannot well be said. All these things can pass over into and become part of life's daily round. As a matter of fact, only one who studies in this anthroposophical way is qualified to educate children, because he will be able to provide them in their early years with what, as he knows, they will be able to use in the latter part of their lives. The responsibility that a man assumes when he instills one thing or another into a child is not realized today. It has become the custom to look down on these things, to speak of them from the high horse of materialistic thinking. I should like to illustrate this by an experience we once had here in Berlin. A visitor once came here who was one of those who think that if at some time in their lives they have attended one or two meetings, they are well equipped to form an opinion on everything. Such persons desire to learn about a spiritual movement like anthroposophy so as to be able to write objectively about it. Those who wish to provide the world with newspaper articles believe they can judge of a movement by going to one or two lectures. This visitor also went away and wrote, and it was curious to read later on in an American paper what was said of one of our anthroposophical meetings. Of course, the description given was strangely correct, but as I have said, if anyone really wishes to grasp anthroposophy, it cannot be done in that way. It is only possible to penetrate into the life of anthroposophy if one has the distinct will, really, to enter into it in detail and experience. I am only saying all this to characterize the opinion formed by this visitor, which he did not hide under a bushel. He said he did not like the way anthroposophy splits up, splits up everything, dividing the world into physical, astral, devaconic world, and so on. Why should everything be so split up? This was, after all, one or two visits. What a terrible effect it would have had on him if he had heard of the other divisions. He thought it was unnecessary to consider things in this way and that one should speak of the spiritual world in general terms. Why should one classify? People talk in the same way today about education and all other departments of life. Even scientists talk in the same way. The whole world speaks from an arbitrary observation of life, not from an objective investigation of the separate phenomena. That is why the impression such reforms and programs must make on one who is able really to observe the world, is so dreadful. They arouse a feeling that may be compared to physical pain. Take any ordinary book on science today. No matter how conscientiously the conclusions are drawn, it is terrible to see how they are put forward. There is no conception of the way the phenomena ought to be observed. In the same way, many individuals are admired today for blazoning forth their opinions, based as they are simply on their own predilections or antipathies. It is of immense importance that anthroposophists should become aware of the fact that life must be observed down to its smallest details, according to the methods that the knowledge of karma and other laws put into their hands. That is why we can only hope for a blessing on the future evolution of humanity, even on the question of education, if the anthroposophical views penetrate to the fundamental principles of education. Karma provides a firm support for all questions connected with that. 
It is extremely important, for instance, that we should know the karmic connections of a certain phenomenon in education expressed in the view, if a child is properly brought up, he must become this or that because that is what I admire. It is as though the child were supposed to be a sack into which can be stuffed whatever is thought to be right. People wish to stamp their own natures with their personal sympathies or antipathies upon children, but if they knew the karmic consequences of such views, they would act differently. They would see that what is stuffed into a child in that way will work out karmically to make the grown man or woman a hard, dry nature, prematurely old, because the very core of his being is killed. If we wish to educate and imbue a child with any particular quality, we must do it in a roundabout way. We must not try to force the particular quality on the child. We ought rather to arouse a longing in him, for it it's so let me read that again. We ought to rather to arouse a longing in him for it, so that he himself will desire to acquire it. We must even go a step further. If we know that a particular food is good for a child, we must not force him to eat it, but should try so to cultivate his taste that he will ask for it of his own accord. <clears throat> this method certainly differs from that of forcing everything into him as into a sack, saying as we do so, In with you! When we, begin, when we begin thus to regulate the child's requirements, we reach the actual living seed of his being, and we shall see the effects working out karmically in the second half of his life, in his joy in life, in his life force. In his later years, instead of being arid and dry, he will remain alive from the center of his being. If we consider the law of karma in this way, we shall find that it does not suffice to write notes in a little notebook to the effect that there is a law of karma, a connection between the earlier and the later, but we must study life itself in the light of that law. Anthroposophy is only present in its true form when we enter into all details of life. We must also determine, however, to work ceaselessly. We must find time to study all the phenomena of life from the standpoint of anthroposophy. These are a few of the things that indicate the connections to be found in life between birth and death. Now we can trace the law of karma beyond this limit and connect one life with other lives or with only one other, or with only one other. We must connect what we experience today in the present life between birth and death with things we experienced formerly or that we shall experience later in subsequent lives. Here again we could cite innumerable details but I will confine myself to illuminating one important question from the standpoint of karma, insofar as it extends from one life to another. That is, the question of health and especially sickness. <clears throat> Many people, when stricken with some illness, believe that according to karma they have brought it upon themselves, that it is their fate. That alone, however, does not always characterize karma correctly. With sickness we must first of all be quite clear as to the nature of the trouble in a spiritual sense. It will be well to begin with the nature of pain and then to consider the spiritual understanding of the nature of illness. What is the nature of pain? Let us first consider external pain, such, for instance, as we feel when we cut a finger. Why does that hurt? We shall never be able to explain the nature of pain from the spiritual standpoint without realizing that the physical finger is permeated by an etheric and an astral finger. The outward appearance of the physical finger, its shape, the way in which the blood circulates in it, and the position of its nerves, all are formed by the etheric finger. It is the builder, and it takes care that the nerves are in their proper places, and that the blood flows in the right way. The way in which the etheric body carries out these functions is regulated by the astral body, which permeates the whole. We will now explain by an external example why it hurts when we cut a finger. Perhaps watering the flowers in your garden every day may be a favorite occupation that gives you a feeling of satisfaction. One morning, however, you find that your watering can is ruined or perhaps stolen, and so you are unable to water your garden. You are distressed. What you feel is not physical pain. Yet the fact that you are prevented from carrying out your favorite occupation may somewhat resemble that. You cannot carry out an activity because you lack the necessary equipment. 
The external lack felt in this instance, which can only call forth a moral pain, may become a physical pain in the following way. The etheric and astral bodies are organized for the purpose of maintaining a finger as it is when well. I can never cut the etheric or the astral fingers. If I cut my physical finger in two, the etheric finger can no longer carry out its proper function. It is accustomed to have the fingers intact. Now when you cut off a finger, its connection with the hand is broken, just as your activity was interrupted when you could not water your garden. The astral and etheric bodies are unable to function as they had, and preventing them thus from exercising their usual activity is felt in the astral body as pain. The moment the proper functioning of these bodies is interrupted, however, they put forth an extra effort, just as you wishing to water your garden would make an extra effort to fix or find your watering can. Similarly, our astral and etheric bodies must now call forth greater activity in order to repair the injury. This extra activity thus called forth is the actual healing force. Whatever calls forth great activity in the spiritual bodies of man produces healing. Now the cause of all illness is that through some disorder in the physical or even in the etheric body of man, the spiritual principles are prevented from intervening in the proper way. They are hindered, as it were, and healing consists in calling forth a stronger resistance to the disorder. An illness, however, may either be healed or we may die of it. Let us consider both possibilities from the karmic standpoint. If the illness takes such a course that we recover from it, it means that in those members that we have brought with us from former incarnations, we have stored up such strong life forces that they are able to intervene and heal us. Looking back at those incarnations, we can say that not only were we able to provide for what we normally have in life, but we were also able to bring with us a reserve fund that may be called up from our spiritual members during life. Now, suppose we die from the illness. How does it stand in that case? We must then say that when the effort to heal was made, we called upon the strongest forces within us, but they did not suffice. Yet whenever we call up these forces, demanding extra strength from them, it is not without avail, because in so doing we have had to make stronger efforts. Although we may not be able in this life to restore order to any one part of our organism, nevertheless it has grown stronger. <clears throat> we resisted the malady, but our powers to overcome it did not suffice. Although they did not succeed, the forces we called up in making the effort are not lost. They pass over into the next incarnation, and the injured organ will be stronger than if we had not had the illness. We will then be able to build up the particular organ that brought us a premature death and to impart to its special strength and regularity. This will be all the more successfully accomplished if we treat the illness in the right way, even though we are unable to cure it. In such a case we must look upon the illness karmically as something that will, in a future life, prove to have been fortunate. We shall have gained a special strength through having fought the malady without curing it. We ought not say on that account, however, that perhaps it would be just as well to let an illness take its course, because by not interfering and trying to curb it, the forces within us will be stronger and our karma will have a better fulfillment. That would be nonsense. The point is that the healing must be carried out so that the equalizing forces are able to intervene as favorably as possible. In other words, we must do all in our power to bring about a cure regardless of whether or not it is successful. Karma is always a friend, never an enemy to life. It has been shown by this example that the law of karma, which extends from one life to another, works for the strengthening of life. Thus we can say that if any one organ is particularly strong, it points to a preceding life in which that organ was ailing and we were unable to heal it. Healing forces were called up and they have now caused it to grow particularly strong. So we see the events and facts stretching across from one life into another. If we become conscious in the right way of how the core of our being can be strengthened, it will become ever stronger. In this way we can attain an increasing living comprehension of the kernel of our spiritual being through the law of karma. We now come to an answer to the question asked earlier. 
Why do we meet together so often? We do so because not only do we enrich our knowledge when we take in anthroposophical teaching, but also because if it be given in the right way, it is able to make the core of our being increasingly strong and forceful. <clears throat> By meeting together and occupying ourselves with anthroposophy, we pour a spiritual sap of life into all we do. Thus anthrop anthroposophy is not a theory. It is a life-giving draft, an elixir of life, that ever anew pours itself into our souls, and we know that it will make them grow ever stronger. When anthroposophy emerges from the position that it now occupies in the world through lack of comprehension, when it really intervenes in our whole spiritual life, people will see how the salvation even of the physical life, of the purely external life, will depend on the strengthening that can be acquired through the study of anthroposophy. The time will come when anthroposophical gatherings will be the most important sources of strength to men, and they will go forth saying that they are most grateful to these meetings because they owe to them their health and strength and the fact that they are constantly able thereby to strengthen anew the core of their beings. <clears throat> People will only realize what the mission of anthroposophy is when they feel that it furnishes them with the means of working forcefully on the physical body and making it sound and healthy. Those who occupy themselves with anthroposophy today should regard themselves as pioneers, working for anthroposophy as a means of strengthening life. Then only will it become what it ought to be, the right point of attack against what in many cases is weakening life today. In conclusion, I will draw your attention to one thing more. There is no phrase more frequently mentioned today than, quote, inherited tendency, unquote. No one is considered educated today who does not mention it at least two or three times a week. An educated man must at least acquaint himself with what the learned medical profession has discovered about inherited tendencies. When someone does not know what to make of himself, almost everyone immediately says that he is suffering from an inherited tendency and those who do not say it are looked upon as uneducated, perhaps, among other things, as an anthroposophist. Here science begins not only to go astray in theory, but also to be injurious to life. This is the boundary where theory encroaches on morality, where it is immoral to hold a wrong theory. Here life's strength and security really depend on correct knowledge. What will a man be able to do who through the right spiritual conception in his soul strengthens and fortifies himself by taking in the elixir of life? No matter what he may have inherited, these are only in the physical body, or at most in the etheric. Through his right conception of the world, he will be able to make his own vital center ever stronger. He will thus be able to conquer his inherited tendencies, since the spiritual, if present in the right way, is able to equalize the body. If, however, a man does not strengthen the spiritual core of his being, merely asserting that the spiritual is the fruit of the physical, he will have a weak inner nature and will become the victim of his inherited tendencies. These will work harmfully in him. No wonder, then, that so-called inherited tendencies create such dreadful results when people are talked into believing in their powers and thereby deprive themselves of what counteracts them. The belief in inherited tendencies is cultivated while the spiritual conception of the world, which is the best weapon to fight them with, is taken away. First the power of hereditary tendencies is discovered, and thus they become active. Not only is this insight wrong, arousing a life-destroying activity and taking the weapons of defense out of the hands of the sufferer, but it is the beginning of a theory based absolutely on a materialistic conception. Here a materialistic conception of the world begins to play a part that is in effect not only theoretically incorrect, but immoral. This error cannot be excused simply by saying that those who assert such things are mistaken. We need not be too severe in judging those who put forth these theories, but we are not attacking individual scientists here. It is quite comprehensible that they are involved in a line of thought that must lead to such errors. We must admit this in all fairness. The one, perhaps, may not be able to free himself from scientific tradition. Perhaps another considers it excusable for having a wife and children. He would be in an awkward position if we were, he were to break away from the ruling opinions. 
The whole thing, however, must be considered as a phenomenon of the times. Science is beginning not only to spread abroad false theories, but it is also beginning to take away the life-promoting remedies, the spiritual conception of life that is able to fortify and alone is able to stand up against the physical, the power that must otherwise overwhelm man. The physical can only possess overwhelming power as long as a man does not build up strength in his spiritual nature, but when he does, a warrior will grow up in him who will defend him against the physical. We cannot hope that this will come about from one day to the next, but those who have the right understanding of things will gradually learn the anthroposophical view concerning phenomena in the face of which man at first seems powerless. What is not equalized in one life is made good in the long run. If we contemplate a single life as well as life from incarnation to incarnation, we shall see that rightly understood karma is a law that no longer depresses us but is rather one that brings us comfort and force whereby to make ourselves stronger. The law of karma is a law of the force of life, and we must understand it as such. The point is not that we should know a few things, single abstract thoughts, but that we should study the living truths of anthroposophy in the details of life, yet never wearying of anthroposophical work while we permeate ourselves with these truths. If you hold this as an ideal before you, you will be living an anthroposophical life in the true sense of the word. You will then know why it is that you do not satisfy that we do not satisfy ourselves with merely reading one or two books, but regard anthroposophy as something in which our hearts are concerned and that never ceases to occupy us. It is something to which we gladly return again and again, and of which we know that the more often we return, the more it will enrich our lives.